I wanted so bad to preach this morning to continue the message that I started last Sunday on my home and my walk in it, and the first one of obviously being walk in love, but praise God with the message. I got to hear some of it, at least half of it, uh, when I was uh, at home. Uh, it was a great message. How many of you, by the way, if you did have an opportunity you would love to take a trip like uh, Brother Sturtz was talking about. My, my daughter's hand is up. Okay. All right. Okay. I uh, Please forgive me. I, I feel somewhat like I'm being uh, pig-headed. I, wasn't, I haven't been feeling good. I was congratulating myself. I hadn't got what everybody else had gotten. And then Friday night came around, and uh, boy, it just it, it, it hit like a ton of bricks. And I thought, okay, I can't preach Sunday morning, but I am going to preach Sunday night. I was not able to get all the, all the work done on this message that I'd like to. Maybe down the road I'll, I'll add to it. The title of it is The New Inquisition. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. Now, I, I want to I wanna say right up front, I, I struggle with this. Um, you know, as a Christian... In, in, you know, 2014, I want to keep a balance. This, this world is not our home, but at the same time, we're to be salt and light in the place that the Lord put us. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an American, but more than that, I'm a Christian. I have a burden for the nation that God has put me in. Again, that's salt and light. By God's grace, I, I want to I, I want to do what I ought to do in this land, in this place. I love America. I, I, I really do. And it's, and it's more than the fact that, you know, what did we get out of, you know, America? You know, praise God for air conditioning and indoor plumbing and electricity and all that good stuff. We don't have, like Brother Rich Johnson would say, you know, we don't have the flying cars yet, but they'll be coming soon enough. But, um, uh, on the other hand, I, uh, I sense that I wind up getting sometimes too drawn into what's going on in this area. I wind up, I get tempted to get upset, to really, you know, with, with what's going on in politics and stuff. It's all in God's hands. Don't you rejoice in that? It's all in God's hands. I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need prayer with this tonight. I can sense right now. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, give strength where fleshly strength fails. Obviously, Lord, we need your spirit. Lord, please help us to see what we ought to see. Lord, give us clarity of thought. I pray that we'd be encouraged with this message. In Christ's name, Amen. All right. I want us to notice something that is, is, is mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 5. There are some woes that are mentioned. You see it in chap, in verse 8 of Isaiah 5. This is, this is woe unto them that join house to house that lay field with field. There's an appeasement to the law. I don't have time to go into that. There's woe unto them in verse 11 that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Verse 18, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. Literally, that's talking about addiction, by the way. But then look at verse 20. 
Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. That's talking about abomination, arrogance, and abuse. But verse 20 is what I wanted to draw our attention to. Woe unto them, first of all, you'll see it says call. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And then it goes to this sense, that put light for darkness and darkness for light, and then put sweet for bitter, excuse me, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So you're going from what you hear to what you see to what you taste. In other words, just across the line, there winds up being a turning upside down of really what is right and wrong. Now he's using these analogies to paint the picture. The first one does enough that call evil good and good evil. We know that's going on in the land today. I came up, I, I came up with this title on the New Inquisition. I remember uh, a movie that was put out just right when I got at Bob Jones called Flame in the Wind. I don't know why. My one big dream was, I think I've mentioned this before, I wanted to be in a BJ film and I never wound up in there and that was okay. But a, a few friends of mine wound up in Flame in the Wind. It was about the Spanish Inquisition. And of course, you know, if you study it, you realize the Inquisition's total, when it comes, when it comes to the Catholic Church, they started in late in the 12th century and they went on for several centuries. In fact, they've never been officially disbanded. They were just renamed. But it was the Catholic way of going after heresy. To them, People that believe like you and I were turning, we, we were calling evil good and good evil. But the, the fact of the matter is that was not what was taking place. We were taking the Word of God and letting the Word of God interpret itself, not by a pope, not by a priest, but by God's Word. In Romans chapter 1, we read the equivalent of what is said here by Isaiah the prophet, the Apostle Paul said this in Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God. Let's go ahead and turn to it. I'm, I'm, I'm catching it in mid-thought. Let's just go ahead and go there. Okay. Look at verse 24, Romans 1. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor them, their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. And so we go on reading in that, and what it winds up talking about, quite honestly, is the modern-day uh, LGBT movement. Now, some people absolutely have a fit when you say that, but that is a fact. We're not going to spend a lot of detail on that, but the point is, we now live in a time where people are calling good evil and evil good. And for that reason, there are people that are being called on the carpet for what they believe, and we have what I believe is now going on as a new Inquisition. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1, if you would, please. Nehemiah chapter 1. Now, the challenge is, there are some people that feel like, this is not our problem. Why? Because this world is not my home. It isn't our home, but it's our mission field. You heard a man this morning you know, he's talking about can't wait to get to this place and can't wait to get to that place and pass out the Gospels and get the Bibles out. That's awesome. That is fantastic. I'll, I'll never forget when Bernie and I were able to, to, to take our first trip on the mission field. It was to Mexico, to southern Mexico. And it was wonderful. to just You talk about your eyes being open to something. It's a joy to go there. Now, this is our mission field. Let's, let's not forget that. Whatever is going on, 
It is for us to take the gospel too. But in doing that, we're going to wind up coming across people that take the word of God, they turn the truth of God into a lie. And we want to combat that. But what winds up happening? I want us to see something. I love Nehemiah. I've gone to there many times. I want us to read, if we would, about the first five verses. Book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these things, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Do you know why Nehemiah knew what was going on? He asked. He asked. You know what happened when he heard? He wept. You know, I wonder how many of us really, we, we, we get this kind of idea in our mind. You know, it's not my problem. It's not that big of a deal. If I don't hear about what's going on in America or California, that's okay. It's like the, you know, it's like going down to the Capitol. I'm just not going to get involved. You know, we don't want to mix politics and religion. Listen, it's intertwined. There, there is no difference. Like Dr. Bob Sr. would say, there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. All ground is holy ground. Every bush, a burning bush, and every house, a place of worship. My God is as much needed in the capital as he is in the church house. Do you understand? Do we agree? Amen? For that cause, we need to take it into there. That's why we have that prayer meeting. That's why it's great, by the way, to be able to go into there and and give the gospel. My soul, how the gospel is needed. You know, sin is costing big time. I, I, I don't think he would mind if I, if I mentioned this. I was, like I said, on Saturday, I was feeling, no, excuse me, this was on Friday. This was on Friday. So, no problem. I'm on the phone with somebody and somebody else tries to call in and I didn't, you know, I didn't really take note all that much. And uh, then they hung, then they, I got done with that number, and I looked who it was, and it was David Welch, Sr. I thought, okay, I'll call him and see what's going on. He was in tears. How many of you heard about the accident over here at Clarksburg? Yeah. He, he was crying. He had just been in this situation. A woman, was she was speeding, doing 80 to 90 miles an hour. She had two kids in the car, ages three and five. They were not buckled in at all. No way, no car seat, no nothing. She hit a tree so hard, it literally split the car in half. And he was there, and he had to deal with the situation. And he just had to talk to somebody because he had to deal with those children who, by the way, are with their Lord and Savior right now. You stop and think about that. You know, what happens in this world, and you think, why? You know how much sin is costing this world right now? You know how much sin is costing our families? This is why we get involved in these things. I, I wonder sometimes... If we purposely don't listen to the news, because we just don't want to get depressed. This is where I, I, I mentioned to you, I've got to keep a balance. If I really get involved in it, I will get discouraged. I really will. 
But on the other hand, I want to know what's going on in my country. I want to know what's going on in Sacramento. I want to know what's going on in my state. And by the way, you got to understand this. You just might weep at times. You just might cry. There are believers in America that are, are in affliction right now because of their faith. The walls of separation and safety from sin and its consequences are broken down in so many places. The gates, which are kept by God's men, at least should be, are burned with fire. More than any other institution, the church has failed our nation. And that's a sin. How many times have you read the Old Testament prophets, and I pray you do, who wept over and preached before God's people who needed to repent, and they did not? And how many times, as you read those passages, you said to yourself, if they would only turn from their sin, if they would only repent of their wickedness, (coughs) it would be so much better for them. Haven't you ever thought about that? You're reading, you know, you're reading some about, of, uh, Israel's history. And you go, my soul, do you realize how foolish you are? Get right with God. You know, do it. You know, if you don't, I've already read what's gonna happen to you. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, folks, it's 2014. 2014. And the current situation in Washington or here in Sacramento, isn't going to bring judgment. It is judgment. It is judgment. And the walls are broken down, and the gates are burned with fire, and too many of God's people are saying, not my problem. Not my problem. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You know, that's a great song, except we're not just passing through. We are salt and light. Let's get, let, let, let's get the thing to, you know, let, let's think about this. We're not just simply you know, walking by while Satan is saying, you know, nothing to see here, don't worry about it, just move on, move along. No, there are people that are hurting. The gates are burned with fire, the walls are broken down, and there's something that we need to do. But this, again, I'm not focusing on the negative, please, don't misunderstand me. It is our problem. There was a study that was just released by the First Amendment Center that reveals that a majority of Americans believe gay equality trumps religious objections. Now listen to this. 52% of Americans believe that businesses providing wedding services to the public can be required by the government to provide services to same-sex couples, even if the business owner has religious objections to same-sex marriage. And it's not going to stop there. It is our problem. When two cherished rights clash, this man that did this uh, went on to say, the right to be free from discrimination and the right to follow the dictates of religious conscience, society must make painful choices that inevitably uphold one at the expense of the other. This was written by a man by the name of Charles Haynes, who is director of the Religious Freedom Education Project. He goes on to say this, according to the latest numbers, Most citizens now believe that our commitment to non-discrimination must trump religious objections to homosexuality in the public square of America. There we are. There we are. That's the direction that we're headed. In other words, we're having a new inquisition. Now, let me explain that soon. I have one other example I want to give. Each year, J.P. Morgan Chase, Chase Bank, sends its employees a survey uh, survey asking questions related to management and other non-controversial issues. A longtime Chase employee told a professor of Princeton, and this has been checked twice, it is true, that the survey this year included the following questions for the first time. Now listen to this, please. Are you, number one, a person with disabilities? Number two, are you a person with children with disabilities? Number three, are you a person with spouse slash domestic partner with disabilities? Now listen to this. Number four, 
Are you a member of the LGBT community? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. A member of the LGBT community. Not that big of a deal, but listen to question number five. Are you an ally of the LGBT community, but not personally identifying as LGBT? Now, why is that important? Because everybody had to put down their employee number with this. They knew exactly who would who it would be that would say, no, I'm not an ally of them. You don't think that there's discrimination that's going to wind up in work? I mean, it's and it's going to be in other places as well. Now, during the Inquisition, during the Inquisition, what would happen sometimes is secular government would, would get together with the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church would get people and say, you know, you, you, you know, you've done this, you've done that, and now we're going to, you know, we cast sentence on you, and now we're going to turn you over to the secular government, and they're going to carry out the sentence. And folks, we had people that were burned at the stake. We had people that went through horrible, horrible situations. And I mean, this lasted for a good many years. Now, the Inquisition today is not the same thing. But what is happening now is we are being challenged. We are being challenged with what we believe. That's what I'm trying to get us to is we've got to sit down and we've got to ask ourselves, not only what do we believe, but also are we acting like we believe it? There was a verse that Brother Sturch used this morning, this one of my favorites out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. What he's talking about right there is, there was somebody that needed to stand up and say, this is right, this is wrong, and God says, okay, because of you, I will not bring judgment. But he says, I found none. I found none. I believe that one way that we are going to wind up being attacked is along the lines of what we say we believe. In fact, I spoke to Brad Dacus this last week about it because it was just, it was speaking to me so much. You know, I just really, I can, I can smell this. I can see it. I've been reading that book by Todd Starnes, Godless America. And it just, I, I'm just thinking my soul. Turn, if you would please, to Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one. I'll be done here in a few minutes, but please hang, hang on with me on this. Suppose one morning you're reading your Bible. And in fact, you're in the book of Joshua. And in fact, it's Joshua chapter 1. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> the Lord's there. I know it's not going to happen, but just suppose it did. And he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take you out of this time period and I'm going to take you back to Joshua's time and instead of Joshua doing what he did, I'm going to have you do it. I'm going to have you do what Joshua did. And you go, wait a minute, Lord, you, there's, there's no way, I, I can't do it. I don't have what Moses had, I don't have what Joshua had. You got, Lord, you've got to understand. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. The Lord says to Joshua, and he says it to you, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Did you hear that? Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Skip down, if you would please, to verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now listen to what he said there. 
For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Makes it personal, doesn't it? Can you imagine God coming along and saying, listen, whatever it is that you do, if I took you back to where Joshua was, I would tell you as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. See, this is what I'm trying to encourage us in. You know, we read about the Inquisition, we read about how our, our brothers and sisters in Christ suffered so long ago, but the fact of the matter is, we've got the same God that they had then, we've got the same God now. I'm telling you, there is a new Inquisition. It's here, it's not just coming, it's here. It's starting to trickle in, but when we've got, we, when we've got, um, when we've got personal feelings in people, Starting to sway, it doesn't matter what our Constitution says. I'll never forget hearing a Christian that lived behind the Iron Curtain in Romania. I'll never forget hearing him as he talked with a pastor. This is before the Iron Curtain went down. And he said, Pastor, he says, do you realize, it was an American pastor. He said, Pastor, do you realize that our Constitution guarantees religious freedom? It guarantees it. But we don't have it. It's got to be a certain type of religion. And that's the type that gets freedom. Folks, we've got the religion that people don't like. And we might think that, well, you know, praise God, if they're going to get to us, they have to, they have to go uh, against so many other people, the Mormons and the Catholics and stuff. I'm not banking on that for anything. Absolutely not for anything. I believe that eventually our church covenants and constitutions will be used against us. I think they'll be used against us. And that mean, in that way, I mean this. We will have people that are in court or people that are coming to us, maybe talking to us when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, uh, news or whatever. And they'll be saying, you know, we got this off of your internet. Let me ask you something. Do you do this, Jack? Shh. Tell me something. Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you, do you really seek to do this? Listen. It all comes down to this. Satan seeks to shred the commands and promises of God in our hearts. God seeks to solidify the commands and promises of God in our hearts. A faith that has never been tested can never be trusted. A faith that can, has never been tested can never be trusted. We're coming across a new inquisition. If we commit ourselves to the Father and His perfect will, then praise God we'll be good. In our church covenant, I don't know when's the last time you read this. I have felt like maybe we've needed to go through this as a church. Let me read you some of it. Having been led, as we believe, the, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, we do now, in the presence of God, angels and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, we engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love. Now, there's verses that are all dispersed all through this. I'm leaving them out right now. To strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort. To promote its prosperity and spirituality. To sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also determine to maintain family and private devotions, to faithfully raise our children the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to seek the salvation of our kindred, our neighbors, and acquaintances, to walk cautiously in the world, refraining from worldly amusements, denying ungodliness and every worldly lust, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our behavior, 
and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the work of our Savior. That's just some of it. I believe we're in a time that is going to be a challenge. You know what? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I am sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pooped out right now. Can I see that from the pulpit? <laughs> Too late. Yeah, exactly. But I really believe that God's people are going to be challenged in the workplace. I believe we're eventually going to be challenged in the worship place. There is a new inquisition. It is here. It's not that it's coming. It is here. It's not like the old one. It's not blood, and it's not torture, and it's all that. But it will cost. But again, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. I remember when I was playing sports. There was It was great to be in the locker room after we played a football game and we won. And we won. It's like, yeah, this is great. That absolutely pales when you stop and think about what it's going to be like in heaven. And we're rejoicing in the victory that we had in Christ. What a joy. What a joy. I hope and pray this week that we recognize that, again, this world is not our home. But we need to be asking, what's going on? What can I pray for? And yes, there are times that we need to shed tears. Look what's happening in our world. Be praying. And then understand that we're getting tested in part because the Lord is purifying us. He's strengthening us. All right, let's pray. Let's stand. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to be faithful. Lord, it's a fascinating time. It's a challenging time. It's an ominous time to be alive. And yet, Lord, You are the same God that we have, that that we see that our brothers and sisters in Christ had centuries ago, millennia ago. Lord, we know that in You we have the victory. I pray that You'd bless. Lord, help us to be faithful. We ask in Christ's name, amen.